I spent about 100 hours vibe coding over the last three weeks or so, with about 20 hours of it being on stream, which by the way, if you tuned into the streams, much appreciated. It's been a ton of fun. Going to be doing a lot more of them, but also I've done about 80 hours of the vibe coding completely off stream with another project that I can't quite talk about yet, but I want to give some of my thoughts on this whole vibe coding thing and how I see AI actually fitting into a software developer workflow. So first I want to show you sort of the projects that we worked on on stream. I'll show you sort of the process I went through. Then I'll give you some of my thoughts on how I'm actually using these AI tools off stream as well. So this is V0. So this is a AI tool made by Vercel. So the same people who make Next.js. And what I found is that V0 is a great place to start for the UI. So this is the first project we worked on. It was called console beacon. And the idea was that you could do something like console.txt and it would actually send you a text message alert rather than just logging something to a console that you have to go find in some logs or have to integrate with a more complex system, which I think was a cool idea. We never ended up fully getting things working, not necessarily because of issues with the vibe coding, but actually just like bigger issues around being able to send text messages. It's actually pretty complicated. But anyways, V0 is pretty good at making UIs. So this is the UI made for our landing page. And I think it looks pretty good, right? Like it's a pretty good landing page. Does it look a little bit template and things like that? Yes. But generally speaking, I think it looks pretty good. And you can see it gives us all of the code for it as well. Now, what I found with this code is the code's not great. I've used V0 now for three different projects and every single one, I was not able to just download the code and run it. Every single time I had to go through the code and fix some mistakes and the code wouldn't even create the same thing that it shows me in the preview. So it's like this preview doesn't actually run this code, which is a little bit strange. I'm not sure exactly what they're doing behind the scenes, but there's some things missing. And I also found that like in our package JSON, we were getting this version of it that would have a ton of extra dependencies that we just didn't even need. It was just adding a bunch of stuff we weren't using. And then it would import things in the JavaScript code that weren't being used. And the code was just sort of a mess, but the UI it creates is pretty good. And I also wanted to create some kind of cool animation to put at the top of that landing page. And I used V0 for this as well. So this is actually just HTML and CSS. So I told it just use raw HTML and CSS. Don't use next or anything like that and create this sort of iPhone mockup with some animations. And it was able to do it like this looks really good. This is something I could definitely put at the top of a landing page and I think it would look really nice and it would make a website feel very professional. So I was super, super impressed with its ability to do this. And then essentially what I did from here is I took the code that V0 wrote and I put it into cursor. So cursor being a fork of VS code that just has some AI tools built into it. So I have a few different things here. We have the web, which is that website V0 actually made. And then console beacon here is the actual sort of package that we were making. And then these were some cloud functions that we were going to run, I believe on Firebase is what we were using for this project. And then I made a little tester to make sure that things were actually working. And this did work. And essentially what I did was I just chatted with this AI a bunch of times to ask it to do things. So for example, here I asked it to create a modern dashboard for viewing logs from an application and for now use dummy data. And then eventually we actually did have it add in that real data and it was able to write code for these things. So if we come back over to the browser and we come here, you can see this is actually the dashboard it created. So we can see these alerts were actually alerts that we created on stream. And these are actually in the database. We can see stack traces and all of that. And we have some settings down here. We can generate API keys. So it created a working dashboard. And we also have this homepage. So this is effectively what we saw coming directly from V0. But I did have to do a few things to make it work a little bit better once we got into cursor. Next for the second project I worked on, it was this thing called AP Instant. So the idea being, if you wanted to create a mock API that you could use to test your front end code, you could instantly do this and have it instantly deployed. So V0 created this nice UI for us. So create your mock API instantly. You have this configuration here where you can configure what you want the API to return. And then you have a preview of what it's going to return as well as a code snippet and an option to copy the URL. Now with this one, I also gave Lovable a try. So this is Lovable. So it's another tool very similar to V0 that is able to generate front end code that looks pretty decent. At least the result looks decent. The code quality, again, I find is not necessarily the best. It's usable, but it's not perfect by any means. And this is what it created. So it has a little bit more to sort of a landing page esque with it. And then we have a pretty similar UI down here and some more with like how it works, some example use cases and all of that. So I actually preferred the version from V0. I think it was a little bit simpler, although I did actually give them different prompts. So I don't know that necessarily it's a completely fair comparison. But either way, the one we ended up using was this one from V0. And with this one, I actually used Windsurf instead of Cursor, which is another 
another fork of VS Code that has AI built into it. And a lot of people were asking in the chat, like, should you use Windsurf or should you use Cursor or should you use maybe VS Code because it has Copilot? And I haven't given VS Code and Copilot a fair shot yet, so I'm going to do that on stream soon. But to the question of should you use Cursor or Windsurf, to be honest, my opinion so far, and this might change, but so far my opinion is that they are virtually the exact same product. So both of them are a fork of VS Code. So both of them, you essentially just get VS Code. Both of them use effectively the same models. I was at least using the same model in both. I was using Claude 3.7 Sonnet. Both of them have very similar UI. So they both have sort of an autocomplete feature, a feature to chat like inline in the code, as well as a feature for the sort of bigger AI agent chat. So both of them do, in my mind, effectively the same thing. Is one faster than the other? Does one have a better UI than the other? Maybe, but there was nothing big enough for me to say, oh, I have to use this one or this one. I was just sort of testing both. And which one I would use personally, I think is probably more down to just which one is going to be cheaper for my own use case, because at this point, they feel like effectively the same product to me. And it's worth noting that I didn't actually use these products for absolutely everything. I also just use chat GPT sometimes. So for example, we needed a database in Superbase to keep all of these APIs. And what I decided to do was to just use chat GPT for this. So I told GPT to create the database and it gave me all of the SQL code to create that database. And we went through a few things to make some changes based on what it had given me and some differences I wanted. And then I also asked it to give me instructions for the AI in Windsurf to be able to actually use it. So I said, I need to instruct an AI agent to use this database. Give me a prompt I can use so that it has all the context on the database schema, which I think was a very smart thing to do because now I had this amazing sort of write up on how this database actually works. And this meant that when the AI was going to use the database, it wasn't going to hallucinate and make up tables or make up rows or columns or anything. It was going to understand exactly how that database was structured, which made it much better when it was actually working with the database. And I also found that doing things like this on ChatGPT was a little bit easier than doing it in the chat feature of Cursor or Windsurf. I think that is mostly because when you are using those features, the AI has access to your code base, which is oftentimes good, but oftentimes it's sort of over indexing on the code base. And if you're asking things that have effectively nothing to do with any of the code you've already read in, it's going to, for one, just sort of waste time going through that code base and trying to see if there's something relevant, but also it might make decisions based on things it finds in that code base that aren't at all relevant to what you are actually doing. So for things like this, I actually found it easier to use chat GPT, but I could have also done this inside of Cursor or Windsurf. And now here is AP Instant. So this is actually completely deployed. So I had the AI help me with deploying it and we have it completely deployed and it fully works. So we can see I'm logged in. I have all the different APIs I've created. This is one of them. We can see my mock API. It's a Git with a status code of 200. We have a response type of JSON. This is the response body. And then we can see the response we'll get and we can get code to actually run it. Or I can just simply copy the URL, come to a new tab, paste this in. And we can see it does actually work. If I zoom this in, you can see here is that JSON result. And if I came back over here, this is going to be zoomed in a bunch now. And I change this. So maybe make this name Connor Ardman. We could hit update the mock API. We can see it got updated. And if we come back over here, and we refresh this, you can see now we have Connor Ardman here. So it does work. It is able to essentially instantly spin up these mock APIs, which I do think is actually a pretty useful thing for end users. All right. So what do I think about this whole vibe coding thing? Is software engineering completely dead and there's no more reason to become a software engineer? There's no more reason to go to algoexpert.io if you're preparing for your coding interviews to become that software engineer? Or is this simply another tool that we're going to be using? Or is it maybe a useless tool that we won't be using? using at all. So I do have some thoughts. First of all, is this replacing software engineers? No. Would I have been able to build any of these things to the point of them actually working if I didn't know what I was doing as a software engineer already? No, absolutely not. There's no way I would have gotten these things to work. I've seen stories of people sort of vibe coding out some startup when they have no technical background. And I don't even know if I believe them after I tried it because I just don't see how I would have been able to get these things to work if I didn't know how to code. I probably would have gotten close. I could have gotten landing pages working. I could have gotten some features working, but absolutely I would have had bugs that I wouldn't have been able to figure out. And I would have ended up sort of endlessly spinning in some cycles where the AI just can't figure out what it's done wrong. Now, as a software engineer who I would like to think does know what they're doing, did the AI save me time? For the most part, yes. However, I've also found that the AI has wasted a lot of my time. For example, we had this issue where we were running into a cores error when we were trying to use these APIs on stream. And this 
this was taking hours to fix. And I was like, what is going on? Why are we getting all of these cores errors? This shouldn't be happening. We're sending the correct headers and all of that. Well, it turned out that at some point, I don't even know when this happened. Maybe somebody can go back in the old streams and figure it out. At some point with one of the requests I made to the AI, it decided to change the URL and it changed it to another URL that was going to give us sort of a similar response to what we expected, but it was going to give us a Corsair. And because of that, I was doing all this debugging and trying to figure out what was going on when we were making a request to a URL that looked similar enough to be correct, but it was not correct. And first of all, had I not tried to use the AI to debug that and had I just debugged it myself, I think we probably could have figured it out quicker. And second of all, had I never used the AI, I never would have had that mistake because I wouldn't just create a random URL that isn't the correct URL. I would paste the correct URL from wherever I got it from, right? That's not a bug that a human would run into. I also, like I said, spent a lot of time dealing with the fact that like V0 created or imported all of these packages that we didn't need and I had to sort of clean up the code base from that. I ran into issues where I would ask the AI to change one thing and it just goes on its own and decides to make all of these other changes that I then have to either then revert or just reject to begin with. And it's like, that's not what I asked you to do and it sort of will just completely destroy the UI sometimes. But at other times, it's able to do things that frankly would take me a lot of time and it's able to do them in merely minutes while I'm just chatting with chat. And that's incredible, right? Like it's able to build things incredibly quickly and when it's able to do it correctly, it's amazing, right? Like it saves you a ton, a ton of time. And I mentioned that I've spent about 80 hours off stream vibe coding over the last few weeks. And that code base, if I had to guess, is probably in the realm of 15 to 20,000 total lines of code. I would not have been able to write that much code on my own. Like there is no way. And I would not have as much functionality in that app if I was doing it on my own. So for context, that app integrates with multiple APIs. It does some web scraping. It uses Superbase. It has a pretty complex database schema. It has pretty complex security rules with that database schema. It has Stripe integrations. It has a lot of stuff going on in it and it does all work. Now, again, did I run into a lot of bugs that I would not have run into if I just wrote all of the code completely by hand? Yes. But was the time I spent debugging those things greater than the time I would have spent building everything completely by hand? No, I don't think so. I do think it is legitimately saving me time. So I guess my conclusion is at this point, we still need software engineers. You cannot use these tools if you don't understand what you're doing, but they are incredible tools that you should be using to be more efficient at your work. That said, you also need to be checking them. You should not be just blindly accepting all of the changes they make, because if you do that, they're going to hallucinate. They're going to create bugs. They're going to create security vulnerabilities, and they're going to sort of just destroy your code base and make it impossible to actually work in. So you have to be very careful, but I do think that these are actually incredible tools that we should be using and that we will continue to use for a very long time. But I don't really see any future where these tools are replacing us. I think they're simply tools to make us better at our jobs. And thinking about jobs, I know a lot of people are concerned about how the tech job market is sort of reacting to all of these tools and if it will ever fully recover. So if you're curious on my thoughts on that, you should watch this video next.